we have some interesting topics that ironically came out of the boring grind that I had to do uh, in the previous stream where I went through the standard Huffman tables in the JBIG2 standard and implemented them. And today thinking about it, I realized that I actually um, didn't do this in a, in a very smart way. And there is a big improvement we can make, I think, that not only makes things more efficient, but also makes things cleaner and, and more robust, I think, in the end. So it's, it's a win. It's just a, a win for the code base. And we get to talk about a topic that would have come up anyway sooner or later. And uh, that is the topic of um, generating code automatically. <clears throat> but let's start at the beginning. So currently we have some functions that initialize a generic Huffman table structure to represent a specific standard table as it is given in the JBIG2 standard. So for example, there is a standard table B1, a standard table B2 and so on. So I think there are 15 of them and various uh, data structures inside the JBIG2 file can reference these tables in order to do their their data compression. And if you start to uh, decode a text region, for example, of a JBIG2 file, you need to set up all these tables uh, and then use them for the different fields in the data that come up. The way we did it in the, in the last stream is that we have a structure, so we have a struct that um, collects all these tables that we need for the text region uh, decoding, which is basically fine. But something I did last time that was not so smart is the following, that these Huffman tables, the, the data structures themselves are actually part of this uh, struct and they are initialized every time. And I mentioned last time already that uh, would be nice to have some reuse of tables if the same tables come up again and again. And, but my mistake was that I was mainly thinking about uh, reusing tables that are used twice within the same text region. But what is, I think, even more interesting is to reuse tables between different text sections. And there is a very simple way to do that, actually, that um, also makes the, makes the code more efficient. So we will do that today. And the, the main realization I had is that um, it doesn't make sense to put the data structures here, uh, the actual instances of the data structure inside this uh, text region struct because either a table comes from a user-specified um, table section in the file, in which case we anyway have the, the data of the table somewhere else and we just point to it, or the table is a standard table and the standard tables are just constants. They are defined in a standard, they don't change. So we can just have a pointer to a constant data structure and we don't need um, we don't really need to allocate something or, or later deallocate something. We don't need to have multiple instances. So these tables, the standard tables are naturally singletons. So they have only one instance and that um, doesn't cause any problems. Also no problems with thread safety and so on because they are constant. So um, they are just plain old constant data. However, um, the thing is we want to use the same generic decoding code for all our tables, which is possible because as we benchmarked, the generic decoder is actually just as, just as fast as, as a specially coded one, except maybe for the 
for the smallest of the tables. But the, the difference is not really that significant. So we want to use the same code. And if we change something in the code, of course, also the data structure might have to change. And um, if we would just take a snapshot of the data structures for the standard tables, then we would have a maintenance problem because we would have to make complicated manual changes in, in constant data in order to match the data structures to what the, the generic code expects. Um, and so what we will do is we will just um, create a little code generator that parses the standard tables with the usual code that we also uh, use to parse user-specified tables and take a snapshot of the data structure and generate some code out of it that just contains this constant data structure. And when anything changes, the generator just runs again and um, creates the new data structure. So um, no problem with that. Okay, so that we will do. And I, I thought that was a nice uh, opportunity to talk a bit about code generation because it's a very interesting topic, I think. I mean, of course, you always, always have some kind of, of code generation in your project because you, for example, a compiler generates some code from some description. But what I mean here is um, generating source code that you would otherwise write manually. So um, let's talk a bit about that and, and how, how to deal with it. So the first thing is that sometimes I noticed that people shy away from code generation as if it was something a bit complicated or it, is, it isn't really. I mean, code generation can be as simple as a simple printf statement um, printing something that is compilable C code, for example. And, and even this very, very, very simple um, kind of code generation can be enormously useful sometimes. And of course, you can make it arbitrarily sophisticated with template systems and anything, but you only do that if you really need it. You, uh, today, we will do a much, much more simple code generation. The second thing I would like to talk about briefly is how to integrate code generation into your project, because I think that's actually where the, um, where the biggest challenges uh, are um, related to code generation. So let me just grab my digital pen uh, and let's select a nice color. And also I will take care that I see the chat in case you have any questions. So please just tell me your questions or tell me what's up in general. Um, let's just chat a little while we are doing this. And so let's take a, a nice blue. <clears throat> In your software project, we can generally distinguish um, two categories of files that are treated very differently. So on one side, uh, you have the Oh, sorry, this is comp <laughs> this is completely the wrong thing. I need a um, brush. So so the source. Um, usually the source will be versioned. So in version control. It's always a good idea. At the very least, it should be uh, backed up, but, but the version control is usually the good idea to do. So you have some, some source files. <clears throat> and then you have intermediate files 
uh, that are used only in the in the build when the when the software is actually compiled and linked and so on. So you have these intermediate files. like for example foo.object uh, that is, is generated uh, by the compiler from uh, so let's indicate this also somehow let's say that so this compiles and then uh, this is linked And you get in the end you get um, you get the foo X and so on and this this is then the executable you can actually deploy um, and you and usually you do not put the intermediate files um, under under version control usually you can you can do it differently and we will talk a bit about that so a very common practice which also makes a lot of sense is to put all these intermediate files into some kind of build directory or in my project it's, it's currently called out so you have all these files in this directory um, often you also have subdirectories for different configurations of your build so you might have a debug and a release build and so on so um, And, and then you have these intermediate files and the idea is that whenever you want a clean build you can just uh, remove the whole out directory and start from scratch and you can always reproduce the intermediate files so that's that's the thing that that really distinguishes the intermediate files from the source code is that these intermediate files can be uh, can be reproduced from the source files So you do not lose any information if you delete all of them the worst thing is you lose a bit of time that's the theory so how does code generation uh, factor into this well um, it's not any different than anything else so you could have for example a generator generator dot cpp uh, this of course is um, is compiled and linked and so on it's just a program like any other so compile and link and then you have uh, your code generator exe exe here if you use uh, an in interpreted language like like Perl or Python for your generator which can be uh, convenient then you do not have to do this step you can just run your run your generator and this generator this generator will as generate as its purpose in life it will generate some source code and now the question is okay this is source code but is it should it be on the version side or should it be on the intermediate uh, file side and we will discuss two Two options how you can do this both are uh, both make sense uh, you need to you need to decide based on on your needs which is better this is the first is the simpler one so um, as as the generator should be deterministic um, otherwise you have a problem it will uh, reproduce every time the same generated code so we can say that generated code is actually an intermediate file so we can have a, a directory generated and there we have for example a file bar.cpp that is generated by the generator and then it is compiled and linked just like the other source code um, this is fine so this setup makes sense however uh, there are reasons to do it in a in a different slightly more elaborate way because of the following so the crucial thing about intermediate files is that they shall be reproducible now if your code generation 
is very simple, this will not be a big problem. But if your code generation um, is quite tricky and for example, if it uses external libraries or, or, uh, for example, or which can happen very easily if you use Python or you use Perl and you use the, the Perl version that is installed on your system and you do not version this Perl or Python version or whatever you like to use, you do not version it with your project. And you might have modules installed, so CPAN modules or, or Python modules or whatever they are called. And um, the problem is, it is no longer guaranteed that your generator program will always reproduce exactly the same code because maybe you have a complex generator and some module that is used by that, some third party library or module changes and the generator either doesn't build anymore, this is annoying, but this is not so dangerous because you at least you notice it, or the generator will just start generating different code without you noticing. And this can be a big problem when you want to uh, reproduce releases, for example. So in many, in many areas where you could uh, be working, uh, it is quite important or very important that you can exactly reproduce bit for bit every release that you have put out into the world if there is some kind of problem. So especially in, in, in safety relevant areas, uh, this is a requirement. And that can, it can get really tricky with code generation if you do this simple setup because you, you will be never quite sure, unless your generator is that simple, you will be never quite sure that the same code has been generated again. Especially, as I said, if you use some inter external um, dependencies. So let's discuss, let's discuss an alternative option. that is a bit more elaborate, but that solves this problem. So we, we have again the, the version source files and the intermediate files. Sorry for my bad writing with this pen. So the generator, th this works exactly the same. So you have the, the, you compile the generator and so on. So let's put it here again, so that this is not too confusing. So this generates a generated file. In, this is in the out directory. So as, as here, this is also part of the out directory which is something that is deleted when you clean your project. <clears throat> and now what I did in many of my past projects and which worked very well and gave me a lot of confidence in the setup is that this file bar.cpp is actually not directly compiled from here but there is, in the version source, there is also a generated directory. So a, a, a directory called generated. And you will see how it is, how it is generated, uh, which contains the same file. And it works this way. So this is compiled this generates uh, this yeah this generates this file and this file is copied here by the build system and this file is then compiled in order to get bar.object which will then be linked to your application and so on. And this, this file, which is a copy of this one, so they are identical and I will immediately explain now why you have two copies. Uh, 
this file is checked in in your version control system and actually you can even run your build without even building the generator or running the generator because all the source that you need for a normal build is here and you just need a compiler and linker and you can you can reproduce uh, object files and release files uh, independent of the software environment that you're in so whether you have a Perl update or whatever it doesn't matter you always have your source code including your generated code from a certain um, version of your software um, I, I, I will mention that that in addition to that so um, in areas where where worked where where there were functional safety requirements for for embedded systems that are safety critical actually for every release I even archived all the intermediate files in addition so it's also very simple to do you have just a release script that um, creates a zip archive or whatever of, of your complete build directory and this way you can you you anyway uh, know that you have every step of your compilation and linking that you can check afterwards and so on and if you have a reproduction problem you exactly see at which step you have the reproduction problem but that's just an additional um, safety measure so what are the two copies for normally it's not good to have copies of things because they can get out of sync but there's actually some idea behind it the idea is this that let's say that let's pick another color let's say you modify the generator you're now improving the generator for example or very important you are refactoring the generator if you're refactoring the generator you are modifying its source but you expect it to still produce the same output and um, then the two copies can be very useful because what I usually then do in my build system I, so once the generator has been modified it is compiled you, you get a modified generator exe uh, this will generate a modified or not modified and that's the question generated source code file could be modified or not sometimes you want want to you want it to be modified sometimes not and then what the what the build system will automatically do is um, yeah I, I should have mentioned one thing that this copy that we talked uh, about before is only done if it is explicitly um, explicitly commanded by the user so this copy is an explicit action that is not done automatically unless you tell the build system please uh, regenerate um, my, my source code files this the other the other paths they are done automatically all the time also the generation of this file and the comparison because now the build system will diff it will diff these files and this is done as part of the normal build just when you say make make all or something um, this is diffed and the build will stop with an error and with the difference if there is a difference and that's extremely extremely useful because uh, you if you refactor the generator you don't expect any any difference so a difference is really an error and this checks the errors for you you know I don't I do not have any change in the in a generated code as long as I don't want to have so this is automatically checked for you the other case is um, if you really want to modify the generated code so you change the generator and you expect something new you will immediately see what actually is the difference that you created in the in a generated code so you will get it will stop the build will stop with this error message but you expect that and you can check the difference and if the difference is okay you say okay please now copy so uh, re 
fresh or whatever you want to call it um, in my generated source it's okay and then again you have a baseline where you see if you get differences uh, by by modifying your generator or also very important as i talked before if you if you change your software environment let's say this is not a cpp not a c++ generator but this might be um, written in Perl, for example, and you install some new Perl version or Perl modules, then you, you, you just run your normal build and it will check for you that the, the new Perl version did not make any difference for the, for the generated code. So this is the second version of the setup. It's a bit more uh, complicated than it's, it's not too complicated. It's just it's a bit of work to, to set it up in the build system. Once you have it, it's, um, it's very easy to work with. Um, so both of these versions um, make a lot of sense. And I usually, at least in later stages of the project, when it gets um, ready to, to release, and especially, especially in safety critical um, settings, I prefer the, the, the second version where you have a copy of the generated code under version control. Okay, that being said, we will, today we will do the easier, the easier left version where we'll just uh, treat generated code as intermediate files. It's just a good first step. We can always later convert to the more elaborate second version uh, once we get out of the prototyping stage because currently we are, we are really in full prototyping mode so there's no sense in, in being too cautious about anything right now um, okay so that was that was the general idea I wanted to talk about and let me get a sip of tea and then we will go to work Mm-hmm.